Hi, and welcome to On the Job with Porak. I'm Brian Marvel, president of Porak, and with me today is Porak Vice President Damon Kurtz. On today's show, we have our very special guest, actor known for his roles such as the film in Godfather Part 3, Searching for Bobby Fischer and the Rat Pack, and currently on the hit CBS television series, Criminal Minds. We're excited to welcome Joe Montaigne to the podcast. Thank you for taking your time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. My pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I guess, you know, what we're trying to do is talk to uh, more people that are involved in uh, playing police officers, law enforcement on uh, TV shows and in the movies. And uh, you've been on one of the longest running series, I think, on TV Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to doing that. So we're really happy for you to uh, to be in here with us today in collaboration with uh, American Police Beat. So thanks for coming out. Um, so what actually, what brought you, I guess we should probably start from the very beginning, what really brought you into the acting business, getting into movies and TV? Well, in terms of the acting business, it really started um, in high school. I had no, there was no indication I would be an actor otherwise. In other words, there was no nobody in my family. It wasn't one of these like... Occupy, you know, everybody was a bricklayer, seemed like in my family. So <laughs> acting didn't seem like the logical choice. But I got exposed to it, you know, just trying out for a play on a, on a dare. And it was one of those moments. I was 16 years old and I tried out for that play. And I knew at that moment, even though I didn't, I didn't get cast, but, but the, the whole experience of trying out for it kind of did something to me. And I thought to myself, boy, I really like to give this a whirl. And I really haven't looked back since then. But ironically, only because of the police theme of what we're dealing here in law enforcement, the really first time I kind of made an appearance in something, uh, you may find this of interest, there was a show, you, you, you both are maybe a little young to remember it, but there was a show called, with Ralph Edwards called This Is Your Life. And they would take a, they would take a famous person and kind of surprise them and tell the story of their life. But there was this, um, guy named, um, it was a newspaper reporter out of Chicago, and they were basically doing his, his life story because they had made a movie. His name was Richard Finnegan. They would made a movie about it called Dial Northside 777 with Jimmy Stewart where he portrayed Finnegan. And the, whole, the, 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 the gist of the movie was that this newspaper man was able to prove that this guy who had been in prison for something like 11 years was innocent. But I remember uh, I, was a, I had had rheumatic fever as a child. And I was in this uh, hospital in Chicago just for children with rheumatic fever. And unbeknownst to me, I was eight years old. This Richard Finnegan, this was his charity. And he used to come to the hospital and sit with the kids. And, and, and so when they did his life, they decided, now, now I'm 10 years old at this point, it's two years later. They said, let's, let's, as we bring out different people in Richard Finnegan's life, let's bring out one of the kids from the hospital to kind of just for whatever. So I, I was chosen. So, he, so here I'm on national television, you know, uh, and this is your life. But I remember I was uh, sitting on, they, they had me sit on Ralph Edwards' knee. This is, my, my, my daughters make fun of this because they, they found the black and white, you know, TV tape of this and somehow in the archives of, you know, the internet. But Ralph Edwards asked me, so little Joey, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be a policeman. <laughs> and, and I did. At that age, at 10 years old, I wanted to be a policeman. And I think part of it was because I grew up in a time, you, you got to remember, this was the 50s in Chicago, where if we were playing outside in front of our, our, our apartment, you know, I lived in apartments back then, my family, that if it was starting to get maybe dusk, all of a sudden you'd feel a little tap on the back of your head and you'd look up and it would be the beat cop. You know, the guy from the neighborhood who would say, and who you knew his name, and he knew you, and he'd say, Joey, it's getting dark. Should you be going home? Yeah, and this officer, whatever his name was, probably O'Flynn or something. It's not Irish in Chicago. <laughs> right. yeah. So that was it. I always had it in my mind to play a, to be a policeman when I grew up. And so, the, and, and so when you, you ask how did my career start, I think, well, that was the first time I ever did anything in show business was being, you know, as 10 years old, being on this show. And so the very first words out of my mouth on national television was, I want to be a policeman. <laughs> my daughters to this day, they kid me about it because they say I'm like Pinocchio saying, I want to be a real boy, you know, because <laughs> I, when I say that. But anyway, that's, that's, how the, that's how the career started. But there, but there is a whole kind of path that takes involving law enforcement that I guess, well, you, you, you ask the questions, I'll give you the answers all the best I can. So I guess with that said, then... Um 
how did Criminal Minds come around? Were you offered the part, or did you know about it? Well, I was offered it in, in a sense, because what had happened was um, um, the show was already in production. It was, they had already done two seasons of the show, and they were just getting ready to start their third season, which would become 15 seasons. Uh, thank God, as it turned out for me. Uh, but I, to start season three, uh, one, of the, one of the actors had left the show, um, and they needed to replace him place him and apparently my name came up I think part of it I, I was lucky in a way that I had done a series called Joan of Arcadia prior to this and we did two seasons of that and when that show you know as shows do get canceled after the second season it got canceled I remember seeing that all of the crew were packing up their stuff on the last day and a lot of them were putting it in boxes that said criminal minds and I said what's what, what does that mean and they said oh well, we the, the entire crew has been the same producer is going to go to this new pilot, this new series called Criminal Minds. So we're all going to go to get the whole crew. And I'm thinking, oh, good luck, fellas. It's not, you know, this entire crew that I've been working with for two years, we're now going to the show Criminal Minds. So as it turned out, when a few years later this opportunity came up, I think I had a, 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 some advantage in the sense that the entire crew was like kind of campaigning to like, why don't you call Joe? You know, he'd be good for the show. So I think that kind of helped maybe put a bug in the ear of the producers. But one interesting aspect of it is when the producer at the time, Ed Brunero, was our showrunner. Ed Brunero was 10 years a Chicago policeman. He was a beat cop for 10 years. I mean, just a regular uniform cop in Chicago. But used to watch television thinking, I could do that. I think I could write that. He, had this, he knew he kind of felt he can do it. Make a long story short, he, he, he created the series Third Watch, came out yeah, here, yeah. moved out here, yeah. and became a successful uh, showrunner. So now he was running the show, Criminal Minds. And, and what's funny is, I mean, I'm from Chicago all my life, and here, here's Ed. Ed makes me sound like I'm from London because his accent is so, you know, you, hey, Joe, come over here. We're going to talk about you, you know. So he <laughs> asks me. I remember on the first day I met him when we had our meeting, he goes, uh, well, okay, so you have any input on your character? Like, how would you like your character to be? I mean, I, I mean they were going to tell me, of course, that I was going to play an FBI agent, blah, blah, blah. But they said, what about uh, your personal input? What, uh, what, do you f- what do you feel? I said, and then I told him the story. I said, Ed, if you don't mind, if possible, I would like to name my character David Rossi. And he says, why? I says, because if you recall or may not recall, years prior, how many years it was from that point, the O.J. Simpson trial was going on, and everybody in the world was watching it. And I was doing a movie, I remember at the time, I was in Maine. And I remember we were all, it was the day of the verdict, and we were all kind of watching the, the, the TVs on location. But what, I, what had stuck with me as we all were watching the trial is that the very first person that was called to testify in the O.J. Simpson trial was an LAPD officer named David Rossi. He was the watch commander. The, the, the defense attorneys had brought him in to start the trial. So I remember, like everybody, we're all watching the trial. Here comes this guy comes up, and he's a good-looking guy. He had hair like mine, white, kind of white hair, so, because he was getting near retirement. And he was in his dress blue uniform, and he got up there. And they started questioning him. And it became apparent that, aha, uh-huh, this is going to be the defense's strategy. They're going to try to indict the police department. And for two days, they kept this guy on the stand. And all I could think of is, why are they keeping this good-looking Italian guy in his dress blue uniform, on beating him up? And all this guy did was kind of answer the phone and sent the policeman to the scene of the crime. And he, and he conducted himself with such poise and intelligence. You could see at times that I'm thinking to myself, oh, my God, if it was me up there, I think I would jump up and strangle these lawyers. But he would say, no, sir, that's not the way it happened. Or, Papa, yes, sir, no, sir. And I said to myself, I said, maybe it goes back to me wanting to be a cop when I was eight years old. I said, someday, if given the opportunity, I'm going to name a character after this guy, not just because of him, but just to kind of make up for all the crap that police have to take in their day-to-day life. You know what I mean? And so I said that. And what happened is I did a movie call shortly, during that same time, I did a movie call Eye for an Eye with Sally Field. And I have to play an LAPD detective in it. <laughs> I went up to John Schlesinger, who was the d- director, the same guy who directed Midnight Cowboy. I said, John, he was British. I said, John, what did you think about this? How about I name my character David Rossi? And I explained to him why. And he went, oh, that's a lovely idea. That would be such a strange. <laughs> so I tried to do it. 
But Paramount Pictures found out that the trial was still going on. Oh, geez, yeah. They call up and they call up the studio and they say, you can't, you can't, this guy can't be naming himself David <laughs> Rossi. And so I, I, I couldn't do it. So they changed the name. And I, I, I wound up doing the movie. 15 years later, just about 15 years later, something like that is when uh, I got offered Criminal Minds. So I tell the same story to Ed Bernero. Ed Bernero being the former Chicago cop that he was, says, that's a fantastic idea. Let's do it. Well, real quick before Damon asks you a question, have you met the officer? I absolutely met the officer. He's one of my closest friends right now. And the reason is I, 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 we decided on doing that. Ed Bernero was, uh, had to do an interview at some point shortly after I got hired. And, and one of the questions to him was, oh, so Joe Montaigne is now going to be on your show, Criminal Minds. Uh, and what's his character's name? Oh, his name is David Rossi. Oh, and, and uh, well, how did he come up with that? Or, you know, is there any significance to that? And he told the story. He said, well, Joe decided to bop, 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 bop. So anyway, the real David Rossi, who by now is retired, living in Idaho, uh, some friend of his read the article and called him and says, you know what, I, I don't know if this is true, but I think <laughs> this actor on Criminal Minds has just named his character after you. And so he, David Rossi, sends a letter to, you know, he found out who my agent, agency was, you know, just go on the Internet. And my, I get a letter saying, dear Mr. Montaigne, I don't know if this is true or not, but I've been coming to my attention that you maybe have named your character after me. <laughs> And I, I, and he put a phone number and whatever. I called him right away. I said, Dave, look, yeah, Joe Montaigne here. I did. It's true. <laughs> uh, first of all, are you upset? Are you going to sue me? Would you care? You know, and he's like, no, oh my God, no, I'm flattered. You know, blah, 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 blah. Anyway, he, his children lived in L.A., so he, he, he says, yeah, I come to L.A. Pr- pretty frequently, at least once or tw- twice a year. I said, okay, well, come on, let's get together. And we did. I mean, make a long story short. If, if people who watch the show Criminal Minds, who really watch it avidly, and some fans really – look at every little thing. On my desk, if they ever pan a, a shot of, on my desk, you'll see me standing in a one photo. There's a guy on my right who looks like he could be my older brother because he had white hair and my hair was still dark at the time, you know, when I first started the show 15 years ago. And he's here, and then there's a young guy on my left. What people don't realize, they, they probably look at it and say, oh, there's a show, oh, that's, that's David Ross, he's with supposedly maybe his cousin or brother or something. It's the, the real David Rossi on my right and David Rossi Jr., his son, on my left. So oh, there's wow. three guys named David Rossi in this photo. That's but only, only we know that. You know <laughs> what I mean? And one interesting aspect of it, and one reason why I'm so glad I did this, beyond the fact that I was just wanted to do it, I asked him once, and I've, like I say, I've, I know David. He, he writes me about every six months saying, Joe, could you send me an autographed picture? There's a nurse I'm dating <laughs> up here, and she <laughs> doesn't believe that you really did that. Uh, I said, absolutely. Now we signed it from, you know, on behalf of the real David Rossi, and then I sent it to them. Very nice. But I asked David, I said, David, I got to ask you. You were the only guy who testified from the police department who went up in your dress blue uniform. Everybody else was dressed like, like you know, in a suit. Right. I said, it. you were the only guy. Right at the beginning, I said, you had the cap, the thing, the whole nine yards when you came in. I said, what was that about? He says, I'll tell you. He says, you got to understand, I was getting ready to retire. It was my last year. He says, and my the powers that be, when they, they, they knew I was going to be the first one called for the trial. They knew I'd be number one. They said, look, Dave why don't you get yourself a nice suit? Just go up. The last thing we want to do is just, you know, they had a feeling that they're just going to come after the police department. That's their only defense. They said, so why, why call any more attention to it than we need to? He says, well, you know, people have a, sometimes people, there, there are going to be people who have a negative feeling about a uniform even. So just go up there and be, your, be yourself. And he says, I went out, I bought the suit. And he says, that morning of the trial, I was getting dressed, I put the suit on, and I'm looking in the mirror, and I looked in the mirror and I thought to myself, I've been wearing this uniform for something like whatever it was, 25, 28 years. I'm getting ready to retire. I have nothing to be embarrassed about or to be sorry about or to apologize for. He says, I'm not going up there any different dress than I would on a normal day to work. So he says, I put on my dress blue uniform and said, the hell with it. This is, this is who I am. This is I have nothing to apologize for. Right. I said, Dave. That's why, even subconsciously, <laughs> I knew it was a good idea to name my character after you. Very nice. And so, that's, anyway, that's that's, that's a, it's guys like that and, and and things like that that just hope. It's part of what's why I'm here. Yeah. So I'm sitting in front of you guys right it's now. It's a it's a great. I love that story that gives a name or a reason for the name. I think that's awesome. And after paying, playing David Rossi for so long, is it 
changed your perspective on law enforcement or given you a different uh, view on things? You know, it hasn't changed it because I always had it. I mean, mm-hmm. I always had that respect for it in the sense that, look, um, I, 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 I'm very blessed. I have a job. There's a saying that goes, the, 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 the three best jobs in the world are to be like a rock and roll star, being um, a movie star, an actor, or being an astronaut. But being an actor is the best because you can play the other two. Right. You know? And so there's that. So I've always felt very blessed that I, I have an occupation where I kind of play pretend. And if you probably asked, did a, a survey of people on the planet Earth of like, what would you be your, your, you know, secret wish as a profession if somebody can just grant it to you? A lot of people would say, oh, I'd like to be a TV star, movie star, you know, blah, blah, blah. I get it. I get that. But on the other hand, I portray guys and have often done it, especially when I play somebody in law enforcement, who have chosen a life style, a profession that could invariably, their job could cost them their life. And I never forget that. And so I have such respect for people in uniform in the sense that whether it's the military, whether it's people in fire fire department, people in police, you know, law enforcement, that at the end of the day, and then you always, you'll hear the stories, oh, yes, or oh, so-and-so, you know, but, 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 but the cops did this, or the cops did that, or, you know, this mili- guy in the military did this, and another guy did that. Yeah, okay, of course it happens. It's bad. Yeah, we know that. There's bad apples in every profession, whatever it may be. But at the end of the day, how many people could say, oh, yeah, you know what I do for a living? I do something that hopefully protects other people's lives, and at the end of the day, it may cost me mine. But that's that's the choice I've made, and it, it, to me, that's that's the bottom line. That's where you got to go to. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and so, all the other stuff is going to happen. But at the end of the day, I just have such tremendous respect for anybody who decides to. You know, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. Put on this, put on this uniform, and do this. And I, and, I, and being from the Vietnam era as I am. I mean, I lost friends that from during during that during that time, and 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 I think about that, and I think, and sometimes like when I got my star, and I was fortunate enough to get a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, and one thing I did say that it was important to me that I felt needed to be said is I said I'm very honored to have a star on the street. You know, people will walk by and say, "Oh, Joe Montana, there's that star on the Walk of Fame." I says that's what we do here in Hollywood. We give stars the people who make a living pretending to be heroes, you know. I said, but in Washington, D.C., they've got a wall with names on it of people who really were heroes. Right. And yeah. so I never want to forget the difference, you know. Absolutely. So that, uh, that, to me, that, that's, that's, that's my feeling about it, and that's why I feel the way I do. No, and we're, we're extremely grateful because we need ambassadors like you that are willing to talk about this because – a lot of times, you know, you see the news and you see sometimes in the media and it's never, there's, you don't see too many positive stories about the great work that officers are doing out there every day, especially public safety on a daily basis. Oh, absolutely. So to have somebody like you who's actually, you know, portraying somebody on film, but also, uh, you know, you have, you have a broad support of people who follow you uh, because of your occupation and being an actor. Um, I think it's important to hear voices like you out there that talk positively about police officers because sometimes I know with us, being in the profession just seems like we're always getting beat on uh, in the news media. Sure. So I guess, um, you know, being in the criminal mind, um, you know, TV series, um, how, do, how, do you, how do you prepare for that, especially when it comes to, you know, the law enforcement piece? Yeah, well, as with any role, and I've been in this business 50 years now. It was my 50th year in show business, actually, 2019. Um, depending on what you're doing, you, you, you try to do as much research as is apropos to the role you're playing. Like, in other words, if I was just playing a, a, a dad or something who just had, you know, his job was not part of the story, then the amount of research, I, I am a dad, so it's like, okay, I guess I could draw on that, you know. Right. But if you're talking about where you're playing a specific profession, you want to obviously try to learn as much about that as possible. So in the case of playing, when I was hired to play uh, David Rossi, a member of the FBI, uh, one of the first things I asked was, 
hey, is there any chance I could kind of, you know, and luckily we had a former, well, at the time he was, he was active FBI agent who was part of our, our uh, writing staff and then ultimately retired while we were doing the show. And, and, to, and so from the very first day of Criminal Minds to, to the very last day, he was on staff. His name is Jim Clemente. And he and his brother were both FBI agents. And just a great, great human. Of course, he was thrilled because his name's Clemente. And he says, oh, my God, you're making him an Italian guy? Playing. <laughs> he says, my father's going to be so thrilled, which he was. But anyway, um, but through Jim, I was able to um, uh, make various trips to Quantico and actually go to Quantico and spend time there and talk to people and kind of just get a feel for it and just get a, you know, again, just, just immerse yourself into what that world is that I'm going to hopefully have to portray a part of it, hopefully as honestly as possible. You know, now of course you take some theatrical license when you do a show, but within that, we wanted it to be as truthful and honest and reflective of what they really, those, these men and women really do. And I think we've we've succeeded. I mean, I think partly that's why the show's been successful. And also the times I would go to Quantico, the, res, the, the kind of response I would get from the agents and the people who work there, the analysts and all that, was that, you know, in the lex, lexicon of, of, of television, and they felt you guys are getting it perhaps more right than, than most of these shows do that make it seem like it's all like, yeah, okay, you know, it's all like you know, crazy, you know, like a college dormitory as opposed to the real deal. So anyway, I try to try to, uh, as I say, do as much research as possible, and within the framework of a you know uh, of a television show, at least try to portray um, what that life and world is like as as honestly as possible, and um, and hopefully we've done that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think getting thumbs up from. FBI agents about a show where you're playing an FBI agent as uh, I think that's huge uh, accolades for what you're doing. Then. Yeah, I mean, and like I said, because since we always had the real deal guys on staff, I mean, we never could go really too far afield from that, and, and which as it should be. So it sounds like the the season or the actual show is wrapping up. Um, the show is actually yeah, we've actually completed <clears throat> the, all of the episodes, but there are ten that have yet to air. So in other words, these will be the last 10 episodes of Criminal Minds ever. Um, but we've already done them. They're terrific episodes. I think it, it's, it'll be a satisfying end to 15 seasons of a show. We wound up doing 325 episodes, which is, wow. which is a, a good amount. And the, what's also interesting, the show is so big all over the world. I mean, the show p- proportionately is probably even bigger foreign than it is domestic. Because I, I go, when I've done a lot, a lot of publicity for the show in other countries. And, you know, I've been to France where they go, do you know how popular your show is? You're the most popular show in France, (laughs) things like that. And so it's kind of heartening to hear things like that, that uh, we have this incredibly huge syndication all over the world. And uh, and, and we we all, I mean, we we take pride in that, and we all took it very seriously from the writers to the the actors to everybody connected with the show, producers, everybody. So what's it like to wrap up a show with 15 years? I mean... You probably you see the end in sight. And yeah. It's like you've been with this family. Yeah. You know. Well, it's a little like school in a sense. If think about it, it'd be like going to all of grammar school, all of high school, and then being told, "All right, you know, if you want to do a little college, okay, but otherwise you're done. See you later." And it'd be like, "Oh, it's a, it's an adjustment, you know." But as I said, I've been in this business 50 years. I never expected the thing to last forever. Anyway. Right. And I was somewhat surprised that it lasted as long as it did because so few things do. So it was bittersweet, but yet on the other hand, it, it's an experience I'm so glad I was part of. The eight of us that wound up being the the, the uh, regular cast, all, you know, there were changes made all during from that whole 15 years, myself included. But that 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 fun, the last we call ourselves, the, you know, the great eight, the last the last eight of us who were left that, that were the regulars the last few seasons. We really bonded in a special way as well. To this day, to every day, there's like a there's like a text thread between all eight of us for some reason or another. Nice. Uh, so, and I'm sure it's no different than the bonds, obviously, that you guys make in law enforcement and things like that. People you you spend, if you think about it, you spend probably more hours with them than you do with your family. If you added up the hours, yeah, absolutely. So because yeah. of that, you, there's no. You know, there's no discounting that. There's no denying that that's, that's an important part of your life. And so I'm just glad it was an important part of mine. Absolutely. Awesome. 
So I think it would be also, you mentioned a little bit about the military mm -hmm. um, in some of your talks. I think um, it'd be good to maybe touch on um, a little bit of your affiliation with the military, maybe some of the charitable work you're doing for that. And yeah, well, so. I, I, um, <clears throat> I come from a lot of military in my family. The only reason my father didn't serve was my father was uh, had tuberculosis all during World War II, and so he was in a uh, TB sanitarium for the entire World War II, and, and wound up they wound up uh, taking his life at a fairly young age. He was only 57 when he died, but he was just all in bad health all his life. But since I did grow up in that era, in the sense of I was uh, I was I was born a few years after World War II, but all of my uncles, I had, my mother had four brothers, all four of them were. At, uh, combat veterans. My dad's other brother was a combat veteran. It was at Pearl Harbor. He, there were two of them who were Marines, uh, three of them were Army. Uh, and, and then, of course, they had other relatives in there as well. But I was very close to these, partly because my father was in such ill health all his life, that these uncles of mine were very important in my life. And it was later on, as as they never talked about it much, as is often the case, guys, especially combat veterans. They don't like to talk much about what their experiences were. But they kind of loosened up later. A lot of them even attributed it to the movie Saving Private Ryan to, to kind of yeah. opening it up for them because they, they said, that, oh, I finally saw something that kind of showed it the way it was. And then when I got involved with doing these, these kind of um, – um, and where it really struck home for me was in 2002 – I was asked by the actor Charles Durning, who was a Silver Star recipient himself in World War II. He asked me, he says, Joe, would you w w want to come to Washington, D.C. with me this Memorial Day to, to be part of the National Memorial Day concert, which I didn't even know existed, this, this concert they do in Washington. I said, oh, yeah, sure, Charlie. Sounds like, like some great thing to do, with Memorial Day concert, honoring the military. I'll come. So I go. So you got to remember, this is the Memorial Day after 9-11. So this, I, what, what I was asked to do as part of this concert, now I get out there thinking, okay, we're going to do this thing. I'm an actor. I'll just get up and say some things. And blah, blah, blah. Well, I get there and realize this concert, which is, they broadcast it live on PBS every year, but they have a live audience. And they do it on the West Lawn of the Capitol. 250,000 people show up for it. Wow. So you got a quarter of a million live bodies in front of you. So, so once I'm aware that that's going to happen, I'm like, Oh, okay. This is all right. A little more than I expected. But then when I've been told now what my part of the show is going to be, I am going to go up on that stage and give the words. They, they'd interviewed, they, 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 they relate these real stories. That's part of the concert every year. I'm going to relate the words of four New York firemen who all four of them lost their sons in 9-11 who were also firemen. So... Now, the night of the concert, I have to go up on the stage, and I'm looking out at the audience, and here's the Capitol building in front of me. The flag's flying. You know, it's night. The lights are it's all lit. There's 250,000 people in front of me. And in the first row are four New York firemen, all about my age, in their dress firemen uniforms with their wives, knowing that all four of these men and their wives had lost their sons in 9-11. Behind me, the Washington Symphony Orchestra is playing Mozart's Requiem. And on these movie screens next to me, they're showing the planes flying in mm. to the World Trade Center. And now I, while this music is playing, the films are going of the planes, I'm having to say lines like, it's a good day when you go into the site and someone comes up and shows you a scrap of cloth and says, I think this is off the uniform of your son. And, you know, and that's just one of the lines I have to say in the course of this maybe five to seven minute monologue I have to give. Well, needless to say, there's a, there was a moment during while I was doing it when I realized this isn't show business. This isn't, this isn't me, Joe Montaigne, the actor, doing a performance. I'm, I'm telling a historical story. I mean, I'm, I'm relating history. It's very moving. And yeah. this is true, and this is happening, and these are the men and women who are... And so when I finished the thing, I walked off the stage, and I, and I, and I hugged them, and I totally lost it. And I, I almost I felt like an out-of-body experience. I couldn't even explain it. But I realized, I said, this is, this, this is beyond, you know, this is beyond what I do for a living. And I went to the producers of the show afterward, and I said, look, 
I said, all I could tell you is if you ever want me to ever do this again, I'm in because for me, this was the most important thing I've done in show business in my life, you know? Yeah. And uh, so they said, well, yeah, that'd be great. Come back next year, so, which I did. And then uh, Ozzie Davis, who was then the host, passed away. And that's when they asked me if I would like them to take over the hosting duties. Wow. So my third season, or the third, not season, but third, uh, third year of the concert, I did that, and then I asked my dear friend Gary Sinise to come in and be part of it with me because I knew Gary is such an advocate for the, our military, I mean, to the Huge. 10th degree. I Absolutely. mean, I, I walk in his shadow in terms of what he does for the military. So they said, oh, that'd be great if you can get him involved. And I knew Gary would respond instantly, and so he did. And we've been uh, co-hosting the show for over 15 years now together. That's awesome. I mean, what a what a very powerful story uh, to I mean, we just, with 9-11 just being so close now and, and seeing all of the stuff that, uh, you know, just trying to memorialize and honor those folks that uh, died on that day. And, you know, with us, sadly, uh, we're, we're seeing the after effects. It's like literally every couple of days we're losing somebody from a 9-11, 9/11 illness. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and then John Vigiano, who was one of those four firemen that I told you about, you may be familiar who he is, but he was the one who had, he lost both his sons. Because one was a New York fireman, the other one was a New York policeman, because the policeman's son knew his brother was at was was stationed at that station near the World Trade Center. So he went to the World Trade Center knowing my brothers are there, and they both perished. And there was the only two sons that this family had. And I remember talking to John afterwards. And again, he was this Italian American fireman that I can relate to. We're about the same age. And he says to me, he says, the only, I says, John, I, I can't even, how do we, how do you even express sympathy for something like this? He says, listen, he says, the only thing that keeps me going is the grandchildren. He said, because both his sons had had like kids and uh-huh. he says, I got to be there for them. But you think about it in an instant, that family's lives were just changed. Absolutely. And so, like I said, how, how, how can I compare what I do for a living to what men and, like, right. and women who like that who do for a living? So it's like, yeah. for me to, to do what I can to bring attention to them to shine a light on what they what you guys have done and do what what people in this profession do why wouldn't I why shouldn't I you know it, it, it's it would be to me it'd be sinful not to right. I think all of us in public service and military appreciate that support from folks in your business you know Gary and yourself highlighting those sacrifices and letting people know that you know, even though you play us on TV, that you you honor those memories by doing so. So we appreciate that. No, it's my place. It's, it's a privilege for me. It's not. It's not even just an honor. It's a privilege. It really is. I mean, I when I, when I will go to Washington D.C. and we'll often go to the whether it's Walter Reed and then Bethesda and then he merged after a while, and you'd meet the, the you know the men and women there, and sometimes you even to see the attitude where. Guys, men and women who have like sacrificed so much already, just physically. I mean, they're so damaged, and yet they've got a good attitude about it. And and, and so many of them just wanted to be able to get fit enough to be able to go back to right. be with their, you know, yep. to, with their with their buddies. And it's yeah. like, you know, you, you wish you can just clone, you know, <laughs> more of them and, and, yeah. and populate another planet with them, and and, and we all move there. Exactly. <laughs> Well, bringing it around, the so now that uh, Criminal Minds is ending, what uh, do you have anything on the horizon? Yeah, I've got a few things. Actually, I mean, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'll, I, it just just kind of happens. So I guess I can kind of state state it now. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm, I'm going to be shooting a pilot for a new thing uh, the next few weeks. It's something that is close to me because uh, I have two daughters, they're adult daughters, but my oldest daughter has autism. So, and uh, and it's you know it is what it is. It, it's uh, it's and people would ask me what's it like to have a daughter with autism, and my answer always is I don't I don't know what it's like not to. So it's a it's a tough one to answer. Okay. But this particular show, it's wonderfully written. It's based on a show that's very successful in Israel, a TV series, and so they and it's, they often do that. They there will be shows that are very popular in foreign countries, and they they kind of Americanize them and make it about here and it's it's a show that deals with young people on that spectrum and I play the old father of of a son in this instance but I can relate to it in so many ways and it's so well written and I just think uh, I'm, I'm you know I'm, I'm happy to do the pilot if it goes to series fine if it doesn't I'm still glad that 
I was able to do it because I think it's it it, it is very informative and very kind of moving and enlightening and will help people under help understand what it's like to be um, you know not just a parent but just to, to, to live in a world where, where you're gonna have to coexist with you know people absolutely uh, on the spectrum like that so I've got that there's a movie that they came to me that uh, they want maybe maybe direct next year because uh, I've done some directing I, I wound up directing in like nine episodes of criminal minds over the course of the uh, the run on um, and so I'm looking forward to maybe that happening but I'm, I'm not a planner anyway my feeling is one door closes you just kind of look around and wait for another door to open yeah. and see what's in behind there and off you go you know I, as they say you know god laughs at those who make plans you know so, uh, <laughs> exactly. so i don't want them laughing at me any more than necessary well what time uh what time is criminal minds on have they you know, I'm not sure because it's going to come on. Looks like it's going to come on mid-season. Okay. Uh, my guess is it'll be right after the holidays, and they'll they'll probably advertise the hell out of it, saying, "You know, this is it—the final ten episodes of Criminal Minds." You know, we were always Wednesdays. We started out Wednesdays at nine o'clock. The last few seasons, I think, it was Wednesdays at ten o'clock. I don't know if they'll wind up putting us in that same slot, slot or not. I don't think it really even matters because there will be, I think, an interest for all the fans all over the world to just finally see those last 10 episodes. Absolutely. And we'll see what happens. But um, I mean, in a way, I'm glad there's been such a gap because now I've forgotten what those last 10 episodes <laughs> are about. So I can kind of like now watch them like a fan myself and say, oh, yeah, that's what this is about. Okay. Well, thank you so much uh, for coming in and taking time out of your busy day to be on our show. We really appreciate that. I want to thank everybody for listening to the show. Hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Don't miss the final season of Criminal Minds on CBS this fall. Let us know what you think. We'd love to hear from you. Please join the discussion on our social media platforms. Go to porac.org, porac.org for more info. Please subscribe, and if you're listening to us on iTunes or Google, please give us five stars. That helps us get noticed. We're also now uploading the podcast on YouTube. Subscribe and be sure to tune in on our platform whenever available. Don't forget to share our podcast with other PORAC members, your family, and friends. All the best and have a safe day. And I want to thank American Police Beat for uh, collaborating with us on this episode. Thank you so much. Thanks again, Joe. Best yeah, of luck. You. My pleasure. And a thanks for all the support to our military veterans and uh, our public safety first responders. Thank now you. and forever. Thank you. Thank you, Joe.